spoken about. I haven't thought about flying for a long time. I have a dream that at that moment when I was alone above the clouds for a long time. I have dreamed waking up in a room surrounded in blue and green grass for more years than I could dream of memory. I have walked back into the past or scratched on the doors of my origins, where it all came from, just to hold up that cape for the last time. Return to Kent Town 10th year anniversary edition is a revised version of Ambien's first poetry book. The book can be purchased from Amazon and it contains numerous additional materials. Spoken, mate. You wake up one morning after not reading a book since your school days and you decide to be a writer. With no good or bad writing to compare against your own, you just know how to write and anyone who tells you otherwise is wrong. Hell, maybe they're jealous of your natural ability to craft a masterpiece. After all, most people need to learn through a combination of books, courses, critical feedback and workshops. Not you though. It's not their fault. They don't realise your natural talent, but they soon will. How to Write Wrong is the new book by Amanda Steele. The book, which is an interactive story, gives the reader multiple options throughout its story. The book can be purchased from Amazon. Spoken Thank you today for tuning in to Spoken Label. Spoken Label was originally set up at the beginning of 2016 and as of recording has over 200 sessions in our archive. Although the podcast can be heard on Anchor, iTunes, Apple, Spotify, YouTube and literally 10 or 11 other networks, the full archive can be found at Spoken Label, all one word, Spoken Label dot Bandcamp dot com. On the Bandcamp, it is set as pay what you want, so you are entitled if you wish, you can download it or stream it for nothing. But if you have thrown me a couple of pennies my way, it is always eternally grateful to help me maintain the operating costs and future running plots for the podcast. Enjoy. Spoken label. Hi guys. And the end. Spoken label. Back in the house. Okay, we've got a special podcast today because we've got an old friend of Spoken Label and printed words on the line today. And because she's such a lovely lady, I've gone and bought in help. Haven't I, Amanda? Yeah. And who's the help? Well, you just said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's, who, who's Amanda then? Your partner. Yeah, the boss. <laughs> the boss, right. So, and also head honcho of printed words. Yeah. Now, we've got a friend of who, who we've got with today, Amanda. Ross. Yeah, Ross, Ross, who's a lovely lady we met her last year. That's what she said in Manchester. And she did incredible forms of a poem that's um, just appeared in one of her debut collection, hasn't it, Ross? So, <laughs> so anyway, Ross, if people wonder who Ross is, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Tell them who you are. And tell us a little, tell them a little bit of background about yourself. And we'll take it from there. Okay, yeah. Um, so, hi everybody. Um, my name is Roz Weaver. Um, so, I'm not a full-time poet, but I started writing um, a few years ago. Um, I suppose for me it was kind of a way to start to process things that were going on for me. I'd always been a fan of poetry. Um, and then I started towards the end of the first year of writing, just to kind of give a go at trying to submit to different things. Um, and ended up being published in a zine. And then I've kind of taken it from there as kind of um, getting published in different journals, anthologies, um, online kind of um, literary magazines. Um, and then I started trying to perform some of my work as well, doing spoken word. Um, and yeah, I've ended up um, recently um, having a, well, it's about to come out next week, a chat book called Smoke the Peace Pipe. Uh, I think then that's kind of where we're back here today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which we heard about today, of course. Now, obviously, we met you. La- I met you last year on Spoken Night, and then we met you in person. As that's what she said, and I can remember at the time when I videoed that. I remember the uh, piece. Obviously, you did two pieces, and ironically, I think it was the first ones actually in the book actually by coincidence. <laughs> so, I'll yes, be it to is. Yeah. My heart is in questions about that problem in a minute. But now, obviously, um, since we last met last year, I know obviously you did Ed in the Fringe last year, didn't you? With that's what she said, actually. So, yeah, tell us a bit about that experience. 
Yeah, um, it was petrifying. <laughs> I'd love to say I like went in there and was full of confidence and it was wonderful. Um, and it was an absolutely wonderful experience. Um, it kind of feels like, you know, when you're just kind of in awe that something like that, I suppose, is happening. People talk about Edinburgh Fringe and then to say you've performed there just feels amazing. Um, it was a wonderful crowd. It was sold out. I think all of the That's What She Said nights were sold out and they did three. Um, and it was a really good opportunity to kind of, I suppose, network a little bit, see people that run some of the other That's What She Said nights across the country um, and some of the other performers um, and just see other shows there as well. I mean, Rose Kondo, um, her empathy experiment was on there. And I know Rose is a big fan of That's What She Said and has performed there at least a couple of times. And I went to go see that. That was amazing, really amazing. So it was just, um, I mean, a bit overwhelming. Um, Edinburgh Fringe, just some bits of it are so busy. I don't know if either of you have been. Um, some bits are so we will go. We will go. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit hit and miss. Some of like, so I went to some free shows of like stand up comedy and they were not funny. <laughs> 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 um, and you're kind of there, like, I think we're just going to leave midway through this. Like, it's just not any good. Um, but some bits, yeah, it's just really crowded, really busy. Um, my introvert side was a little bit overwhelmed. But yeah, it was a really wonderful experience and I love Edinburgh. So yeah, I definitely love to go back. Of course, if you could have gone this year, so we know why you can't go. I would have, been, yeah, and I'd have been applying to perform and yeah, absolutely. Um, you were really coming to perform when you about Edinburgh that you just heard about as well. <laughs> the, the virtual version of it was that. Yeah, I've not, I don't know enough about it to kind of share much, just that I'd seen a post where somebody, um, it was the um, Deborah Francis White who, um, host the Guilty Feminist podcast and she also does stand up comedy and I think she just posted something on Instagram earlier saying that um, they're going to be doing this thing called Shedinburgh, yeah, so the virtual Edinburgh Fringe for this month, I think, um, but I didn't click on anything to look at it. The but best thing for the girls, check it out. We don't know anything else, but check it out. I'm sure it'll be excellent. So. Yeah. And obviously we're here today, Rose, really, I want to talk about your debut collection. Yeah. Like piece. So... Tell us first of all then, how you found your publisher then first of all. Tell us about the story that led to this collection. So um, I'd been published a few times by the publishers, they're called Yellow Arrow. They're an independent publisher in Baltimore in um, the USA and they support um, essentially women writers and, and writers who identify as women. So I'd been published by them a few times in their journals. I'd kind of submitted to them and they have, I think it's biannual journal on different themes. Um, so they were one of the first people to publish me anyway, a couple of a good two years ago. And then I would generally submit to most of their journals. And then one time I submitted and I just got an email back um, just saying how much they, they loved my work and how would I feel about instead of being published again in their journal is to do a collection with them, which that's was right. Asked, didn't they? You didn't have submits, they've asked you, that's what you want to hear. Really. Oh, yeah, um, so I still had to submit obviously like a draft and that sort of things, and they were actually opening up um, for chat book submissions at that point, so they wanted me to submit my chat book. And I think I'm actually, I didn't realise till it came out in their press release, but I'm actually the first chapbook that they're ever publishing. Oh, congratulations. I didn't know that. Well done, you. Which just feels really wonderful. I mean, the whole process has been amazing. Yellow Arrow are fantastic. Um, I've obviously never met in person, um, but everybody that I've met, there's a, you know, with quite a small team, I think, and there's quite a few volunteers. Um, but just at every point, it's just been a really, really supportive journey, and they really do, they really do look out for you. So it's, it's been yeah absolutely fantastic the whole way through. They, they, they sent me over the proof to your manuscript a couple of days ago, and um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not on Monday see, but I sent them a message back saying how much we love you, and uh, like it came back to me saying a really enthusiastic message about you, and I thought oh wow, I thought yeah you've got a real quite positive publisher there, and I thought oh fantastic, which is great news. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, and I remember actually when um because they were they were wanting me or I I suggested that I record um. The moment you hadn't met, the moment you haven't met yet, um, and that I'd record it as like a video thing um, for a promotion, and it kind of I, I was for a few different reasons wasn't able to do it. And I remember then obviously mentioning to you, Andy, about well, you'd recorded me doing that one, um, and I mentioned it to them, and they said, "Oh yeah, we've already watched it." <laughs> <laughs> I think everything, even when um, I got interviewed um, 
with them as well um, and that came out I think it was a couple of weeks ago and um, the interview was just mentioning my blog where I just kind of you know just put the poems I've written but I'm not really big on kind of trying to get a following or it's just kind of a right they all go there in case you know some yeah. my, I lose my notebooks or uh, whatever um, and they were just bringing up random poems that weren't in my chat book to ask me about them and I was like oh my god I can't believe people read that. <laughs> oh, fantastic I'm going to be asking to them if people don't know your blog there's one poem in there, we'll talk about it in a bit. But I know there's one poem in there, I was looking at it before you talked before that, it's 15 standards on it. And I thought to myself, well, boy, it might have time you man, we've got Ross to read that today. That'll take you about half an hour because looking at the length of it. <laughs> no, is that, um, are you referring to the one which came out that might be with um, I'll tell you which one Dear Damsels yesterday? Uh, Life at Douglas House. Yeah, that's not in the chat book, so that's something completely separate. Yeah. That came out with Dear Damsel yesterday, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. And I thought instantly, I thought, yeah, I thought, I would remember the length of that one within the chat book. So I said, well, hey, we'll talk about that in a bit, anyways. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's obviously it's not in the chat book now. Obviously, um, I want to ask you, I'm going to ask you first of all about your chat book. Obviously, mm -hmm. tell us about the selection for the chat book, then, obviously. I know, obviously, like, was it, what were the poems? Brand new poems you wrote the book, or was it a bit of pieces from all over the various times you put together for this? So yeah, they're all they're all ones that have been written over various times. Probably um, that's a good. I'm trying to think what the first one out of them would have been that I wrote. I guess probably from a couple of years ago, maybe the first one somewhere in there up to um, maybe kind of January this year, because I think I submitted my draft to them in March and they were kind of looking for poetry in their chat books they kind of wanted them to have a kind of overall kind of theme of hope so i tried to do it so that my the way i ordered the poems was kind of going from a place of more kind of a place, a place of darkness and challenge and kind of show the, the kind of gradual progress to that more kind of light hopeful place yeah, um, yeah, I got that. I got the yeah. in the back of the collection. I saw the journey that went into the piece, and I could tell that you you'd gone for a journey from A to the end of it. Yeah, no, completely. So, what made you come up with the title of "Smoke the Pipe" piece? The peace pipe. Oh, the peace pipe. I'm <laughs> Smoke the peace pipe. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> dyslexic person like that. Double piece. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it's um, so it's a, a phrase that that's kind of used, obviously, in kind in English and in, in American of kind of making making peace with something. You know, you in um, kind of I suppose historically in kind of Native America and things like that, it would be about pass you would pass a peace pipe. And I was really careful. And we did have a, a good discussion with the publishers about kind of cultural appropriation and kind of thinking about how I was using the saying. And I suppose for me. It, it's about that kind of making peace with yourself as potentially your own worst enemy and a, and the kind of the connection as opposed to the historical context and the kind of religious context spiritual context of where this phrase comes from because a lot of my poetry that I write about or about where I'm talking about kind of recovery from trauma and things like that is about the connections I made personally with nature with spirituality with other people as those kind of connections so I think for me it was I kind of wanted that poem as the final poem because I felt like it brought everything together um, and I think I just thought it was a really good, it just it just felt, felt like a really good title and a kind of overall summary of what I was trying to get across in all the poems really. What did you think to the collection on there? You've read it yeah, so well. Yeah, I read it this afternoon, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, we both wanted to know obviously, um, what was the decision on it obviously when, you, when we met you last year? And you read out obviously the poem I videoed the moment we ha you hadn't met yet. Like, yeah. Then what's the specific decision to put in a poem that's quite a bit longer than the rest of the collected book poems, really? I think I just wanted to try and put in a mixture. I know it's it, it, it reads as one that is meant more for spoken word. But yeah, I think I didn't just want them all to be really samey. Because I think we can all as poets get into the habit of writing. The same sort of way all the time and we don't jump out of our comfort zone and I think it just felt like a very for, for my spoken word pieces it felt like a, one that kind of stuck out anyway because a lot of mine generally will be talking about more particular themes 
or be kind of ranting about something and that one felt quite different so yeah. I just thought it'd be really lovely to bring it in um I was really open to them being like no it doesn't work or you know shift things around but yeah I think for me when I read a, a, a poet and I read their collection you kind of do want and look something a little bit different in there every now and again to jump out at you or catch you off guard a little or think differently and different poems and different ways of writing appeal to different people so it's so annoying sometimes that poetry is so subjective so I guess I kind of wanted to try and bring a bit more of a well-rounded kind of sense of my work completely now if my memory is correct when you read, wrote that uh, read that one out last year you had only just wrote it haven't you as well on my mind yeah i wrote it earlier on that week i think yeah i think you said you wrote it like a day two days before or a day before and i just turned around and tell, i can't even tell you the number i said good god i thought have i literally just wrote a poem like that i could have i only did time to let the brain get used to reading out before i just jumped yeah. on things like you did you just went stood there it kept me on the hook for five minutes. Oh, God. oh, thank you. Well, I think Jane had, um, she she kind of cornered me and said someone had pulled out, so would I step up and do a poem or two? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I think probably because I hadn't had, like, the, the prep time, it just kind of was like, oh, well, I'll just do this. But uh, for me, I suppose, when I'm doing this, when I'm writing a spoken word poem, I'll end up saying it out loud from the beginning. Every time I go back to it to do more, I'll start from the beginning. So there'll be something where I kind of know the flow of it a little bit by the time I come to read it. Yeah, yeah, of course, completely. Um, but yeah. yeah, that's okay. But I mean, I don't, I don't write those spoken word ones quickly. It take ages. Yeah, I was about to say, did it take you long? Was that quite a long piece to write that then, was it? Yeah, I can't remember how long, but like sometimes I'll keep going back to something over like a week or um, a couple of weeks. Um, or sometimes if I just sat there, it just maybe I could get something done in like a few hours. I think I'm quite a slow writer. Sometimes, occasionally, it'll be like 15 minutes and you can just bang something out and like, oh my God, that's amazing. Um, and sometimes you're just there stuck for a next line, aren't you, for like I can't do. Just hours or, and you just have to go away and come back to it. Yeah, I'm pretty glad. I've been doing quite long pieces. It's taken quite a while to live in the piece. Um, I know you, mum's case, you, you were... So we'll tell tell to what we all have your reading writing pattern. You tend to do it at three in the morning normally, don't yeah, you? Yeah, it looks like I've written it quickly, but I've, it's usually been going around in my head for days or weeks or even longer. Well, I say in my case, but there's no set pattern in my writing. It's like I'm writing lots of haikus at the moment. And then oh, no. Yeah, this I t I joined in a small called the day haiku group on Facebook and I set myself a challenge. I don't know if I'll do a book on it, that's an important game. Ask me next year, right? but it's just been the challenge of trying to spend in that zone, trying to write a three line poem every day. And mm. uh, snapshots, so you do that quick, but we're doing something like the moment you haven't met yet, so that would take me from months to write. <laughs> like, yeah. you've gone for a full yeah. life and that's by the end of it. That's what's incredible with it. Yeah. When you're doing your short more page poem, that there's quite obviously quite a few in the collection. Was your writing pattern different to that then? Do you think though? Some of those pieces came a lot quicker than they all did. Do you think some took even longer? Um, I think most of them is is the it's the same kind of writing process. Although often I'll just get to a page to just scribble things down, and I don't know what's going to come out. So I don't know whether it's going to be something that's really long, or if I feel like I've said my piece in a few lines. And then I think sometimes when you do go on, you kind of think to yourself. Could I have not said this more succinctly? Isn't the point of poetry sometimes to say something a bit more succinctly? So why am I waffling on? So yeah, I think I don't know, and I don't know what it is that means. It might just be where my head space is that sometimes you have a bit less inspiration, and a certain poem to take you longer. I think sometimes if I'm really kind of feeling weighed down with an emotion or feeling like very inspired, then something can come out quite quickly. But sometimes, yeah, you can be sitting there thinking, I should be writing right now. And it's just trying to get something out and you just feel like really stuck. Yeah, completely. I'm like that. If you're trying to force the words sometimes, it, you can end up doing yourself a disservice. I think, with it yeah, definitely. definitely. Now, obviously, in relation to book, obviously, we're, we're still in lockdown now, at the time of recording. So was this always the plan to bring it out in August? Or was it, did you, have you delayed it or something, this collection? It's not been delayed. I don't know. Um, it's not been delayed. 
I think obviously the kind of marketing and launching stuff would have been a little bit different if we weren't all still I mean we're kind of in lockdown but also it's that kind of you know events aren't happening and the chances are that some events that we would have gone to to do like book launch stuff might not be happening for maybe the rest of the year yeah or um, maybe some, I know some events aren't coming back at all to launch you know why because yeah yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah so yeah it, it was um I think it was always going to come out around kind of July August and I'm happy with that you know it's um like I've talked with the publishers and and it's a I suppose my the chat book I kind of want it to reach the right people it's not about becoming a, you know this famous poet or anything it's kind I of overnight hit overnight hit like it's on purpose yeah I'm not in it for that, I suppose. But you know, I would want the publishers to get you know as much from it as they can as well because I think they're brilliant. Yeah, um, definitely. The infusion I had on my email is staggered me to a degree. And I thought, oh yeah, you've got a publisher here straight away. So oh, yeah, brilliant. Now you've um, you've got quite an unusual way here, haven't you? What you've been doing with marketing because you've got a course. You do the virtual course at the moment, aren't you? Which is yeah. a kind of linked into the actual collection. So tell people about yeah. it. So um, it's a set of workshops on poetry as therapy. So it's not it's not therapy, but it's I'm a kind of qualified therapist. But it is about because in America, poetry therapy is a thing. Um, yeah, you know, I've never heard of that. Describe it. You know, it's um, there is a poetry therapy. I think there's an associate. I want to say there's like an association of poetry therapy or something in in the US. Um, but it's not a thing over here. And I was just inspired. Um, so I actually planned something kind of similar to those workshops for university last year because I'm doing a master's in creative writing. Mm. Um, and I just thought I could transfer it into, just generalise it to kind of poetry as therapy and just exploring what some of the similarities are and kind of how we can express ourselves creatively, find a safe place for that, how we can kind of share our vulnerabilities. And yeah, I'd um, just talked with the publishers about, because they were looking for virtual classes whilst lockdown was happening. So we um, yeah, decided to kind of launch it and around the same time as my book was coming out so that I suppose it would kind of advertise both of them a little bit better. And then it really shocked me actually because I think it was about two, three weeks to go before the first workshop. And it was a set of six and anyone can um, sign up for any of them just as a one-off or you could sign up for all of them. And I got an email saying that they'd all been sold out for the whole summer. Um, with like three weeks to go and then I was like oh no <laughs> like because it's that little part of me that's like that imposter syndrome that's like no one will sign up and then they'll just really like lovingly and, and caring me just say I'm really sorry Ross but no one signed up and I'm like that's fine it's okay uh -huh. and then you realize you've got to do it but it's great so far um it's really lovely it's really strange doing it on Zoom. I know me and you had this chat before the podcast mm -hmm. started about doing everything over Zoom and figuring out how to screen share and like make sure people can hear sound and annotate stuff and um but yeah it's one of those having the opportunity to when i'd already planned out the workshops to, to follow through with them cool is, what is it have you not been what, what sort of people have you obviously we can't ask you details of people's names and stuff you've only been has been british people a bit of british and american no so they're all american so i'm doing it in american time as well so i'm doing it at like my 11 at night <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah they're all they're all american they're all lovely women different age range a lot of different interests but everybody that has signed up has already got an interest in poetry so i suppose i was i didn't know where to pitch it to start with and yeah everybody is kind of quite experienced in kind of writing themselves already which is really nice because you don't have to go through the basics but also then it's kind of uh yeah you don't you, you can't kind of have the safety net of the basics to go back to because everyone knows what you're talking about um but it's really good there's been some really great discussion so far and everyone's got really different backgrounds and yeah it's so how, interesting. Long, how, how long has each lesson been lasting for you two hours so each one's just an hour um and then there it's six weeks worth of uh, workshops cool. that's amazing yeah. now if people want to get hold of your collection lots where would they best go with you first of all um, so it's available for pre-order on the Yellow Arrow Publishing website at the moment. Um, there's also a link to the pre-order in my Instagram profile. 
which is just at Weaver Roz. And um, it's going to be on Amazon as well. And I'm also, I don't know how much it's going to cost in shipping for people who want to order it from the UK, but I'm getting um, a bunch of copies to sell myself from the UK. So if people want to contact me directly to, to get one, they can do. Now, obviously, we were talking obviously about your blog proposal. If people want to see your blog, where are the best going for your blog as well? My blog? Yes, your blog. Um, so that's just WordPress. Um, it's www.undercompulsionpoetry.com. I don't tend to... I don't tend to kind of do much. I don't know. For me, my blog is kind of, uh, I set it up again like a couple of years ago so that stuff was just somewhere. I could just have it all somewhere typed up. So if you want to do submission, you can find something, copy and paste it. What happens if your computer crashes and you don't, you know, it's somewhere everything's stored. Where yeah, it? that's kind of where everything goes. Cool. Okay, well, right, guys, and girls, now we're in. We're gonna let Ross get a deep breath and we're going to come back to her in two minutes and you're going to read some poems for us, Ross, aren't you? So, and. Yeah. It's going to be great fun because obviously we did four poems this last year to see the development and how, how your work has gone from over this past year. So <laughs> everybody hang around because she's brilliant. We'll see you all in a minute. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Ross. Spock on me. Hi, guys. Straight over to Ross. It's time for me and Amanda to be the audience. Over to you, my friend. Thank you. So the first poem I'm going to read is called How Trauma Dresses at Daybreak. This is about, um, I suppose, how I feel. It's the first poem in the collection, and it's about how, um, I suppose, trauma feels in my body and the ways that we maybe try and hide and mask that trauma from other people. So it's just a short one. I woke this morning in parts, making coffee with crossed wires and crying coconut milk. Washed my body in two minds, one mine, one a critical mother blood weeping from cracks in her breastbone. A broken mirror watches as clothes are chosen with baggy fit for comfort, pulled on with careful movements, for the world cannot know of the war I wear in my chest when I am missing whole pieces of woman. Brilliant. Great start, Ross. Thank you for that. Brilliant piece that one. Thank you. So the next one is called Home is Where the Spirit Goes. And I suppose this is about trying to keep kind of take a step back from um, this, if you kind of are into spirituality, I suppose it's about taking a step back from this level of existence and trying to think about like a bigger picture. You are not so separate from the source that any connection must do. All start as bricks and mortar, but some become burning buildings that bury you. This incarnation is a circular room with an infinite number of doors. Stop paying attention to the pretty patterns on the walls and place your damn fingers on a handle. Practice the gripping, then practice the letting go, then place a foot through the frame into all the versions of you this world is yet to know. That's, that's such a spiritualized, spiritual poem, that one completely. What do you think about this, isn't it, really? It's right. It's quite a deep, more deep talk of that one. So I love it because that's what I love your writing. It's, you've got spiritualism about your writing, and that's, that's a really good piece, that one. So. Thank you. And that's one of those ones which I wrote in about 10 minutes. Really? <laughs> yeah. So my friend was on the way over to my house, and I thought, oh, I'll just start writing something while he's on the way over. Um, and then, yeah, it, it was about yeah, 10, 15 minutes. Wow. So had it been no, in the past? Had that been in the past? Had that been in the past? Because the title of it is so evocative. It's not like Home to the Heart, it's yours is Homeless Where the Spirit Goes. It's Spirit goes. <laughs> yeah. So I've been listening to a lot. I don't know if you've heard of him, and I, all my friends will just groan if they're listening to this because I talk about this person all the time. I listen to a lot of uh, Ram Dass, so R A M and then D A double S Ram Dass, and he's um, a, like spiritual speaker. He passed away um, in December last year, oh, um, but nice. I listen to a lot of him, and he's just very into talking about kind of spirituality. Um, and I think probably I was just very much immersed in his podcasts at the time, and um, or his books. Um, or his speeches, and yeah, I think that probably came from that one. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's the title brilliant with that one. Do you find when you're doing your poems, if we look at the collection, you look back at an this collection, did you find that some of the titling was quite significant in places, or did that? Do you find the poems and titles run hand in hand sometimes? No, generally my titles come afterwards, um, and sometimes it's really annoying. I like sometimes I really hate thinking of titles. I just want to post something as like untitled, unknown. Does it really matter? Why has it got to have a title? 
Um, and then sometimes you can just think of a perfect one or there's just be a line of that poem that you can just kind of take a snippet of and think, oh, that really works. But I don't, titles just, I don't know, sometimes it feels really meaningful and sometimes it feels like you've just had to find one for the sake of it. And, the, and then it's like an annoying way of trying to think of a summary of how you summarise your poem. So the next one I'm going to read is called Vigil. Um, so I named this one Vigil because of what the definition of Vigil is, which I'm just pulling up as we're talking. Um, so it's a period of keeping awake during the time usually spent asleep, especially to keep watch or pray. So the idea of this, I suppose, is about the keeping watch over yourself um, at night and I suppose refers a little bit to kind of maybe traumatic memories or kind of the reasons people might have like difficulty sleeping. Yeah, it's called Vigil. I'm still not accustomed to being wanted for my company, so used to hosting men in my bed and this body. The universe expanding as somehow my space becomes erased. To, to be asked what brings me pleasure should be so every day. I may not be convinced of my beauty yet, but I can believe that I am safe. Even as my deepening breath begs for armour or out of habit, sleep hesitates, both waiting up for the decision my heart makes to trust the hand that holds me. Oh, that's really touching. Never mind that one, isn't it? Yeah. Because it shows, like I said, that one there, it's like almost like a love poem, that one to me, in a very unorthodox way. You learn to love yourself there a lot. And I think I, I love it. It's beautiful. That's really touching. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was holding Amanda's hand there when I thought that. Oh yeah, I can. I, I think you could relate to that. You couldn't yourself. <laughs> oh, she's blushing now. So. <laughs> okay, Rosin, um, do you want to give us another one? We want that. Yeah, the next one I'll read. I'll read two more if that's okay. The last two. Um, so this next one's called Communion. Um, so I suppose to give it some context, I wrote this on the anniversary of kind of the. Um, sexual violence that happened to me which is kind of a lot of what has inspired and is kind of a background to the poetry in the chapbook um which is called communion um and i suppose yeah it's a little bit about more of that kind of trying for that self-love stuff uh, so communion today is for the realigning of bare bones edges exposed Every crack blessed with drops of holy water, for how else would I honour the body of a goddess? Trace my fingertips over this skin with the tenderness of a lover whose touch has gone too long, but right on time to hold these hands as they sleep, only letting go to wipe tears from her cheek. Then wake her up gently, magic cast in the whispers of morning breath, planting kisses on the back of her neck where pulse meets electricity and calls it healing energy, calls it what I need. When I stop waiting for a reminder of my trauma to leak love back into capillaries and find a daily practice to map its journey through my bloodstream, we answer our own prayers. Magic. What do you reckon? I've got an end in that one. Yeah, it? I yeah. enjoyed that one a bit earlier, especially the last one. Yeah, last one's brilliant. And we'll see, obviously, I, I don't know if we've got, whether we've got the final copy here or not. What's the formatting on that last line on purpose, the way it seems more spread out? Um, so it was initially in italics, um, so then with the formatting of it, we've just changed it to be kind of spaced out instead. So we've just kept that as like a consistent thing through the book. So where I would have had in italics, they've just kind of, the publishers have just spaced out the word in. Oh, it makes sense. It emphasises that last line. It gives it a real sort of spiritual tone. Oh, fantastic. Now, you're going to do one more poem for us, Rob, of course, people looking back here, we will notice there's going to be a sixth poem. So we'll get to talk about that in a moment anyway, right? So which we'll put on the, okay. the live version we did in last year. Yeah. Okay. So what's your last studio poem then, Ross? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to read the, um, the the title poem, which is the final poem of the collection. It's called Smoke the Peace Pipe. So um, obviously I've already explained what that, that term means to me. Um, so this hopefully just brings everything together. You have never truly held yourself until every part is loved as truth. The overwhelmed, the undernourished, the misaligned, you are always unfinished business. So kiss each with equal pleasure, lips better spent on self-affection than speaking of self-loathing. Welcome home each particle of your being that never really left but was silenced by the unenlightened mind. We, wild spirits, speak all at once in this one lifetime, found here like some long-lost siblings, are everything alive. Yeah, that well, is... A good way to finish that book copy. That's a fantastic way of finishing that. The studio side of it off, Ros, definitely. So, yeah, 
it does is like it's you can feel by the end of it there it's like i would i wouldn't if i've been trying to carry on a collection after that i don't think you could have carried on after that so that's why it's a really really good way of finishing off so thank, perfect. You. thank you for that now obviously people are going to hang around for the ps as the line thing so is there anything you want to say about the moment you haven't met yet um so the poem is a spoken word piece, um, which I've also put in my chat book. Um, and it's about trying to, I suppose, live in the moment. Um, a lot of us, and I spend um, a lot of time worrying about the future, kind of going over stuff that's happened in the past. And it's kind of about that, like trying to seek reassurance and just being in the present um, and how things can still work out. Um, so the idea of the poem is that I'm speaking to myself in, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as the future me in the next moment that I've not got to yet. Yeah, yeah, I got that straight away. Yeah. I got the letter sign, but it's a little, like, yeah, okay, yeah, perfect. Hang around, everybody. It's well worth hearing this. It's a phenomenal piece. I can full warm remember me and Amanda sat there being speechless when you read that one out last year. So, but thank you, Ross, today, seriously. Pleasure. No problem, thank Pleasure. you. Pleasure to catch you again as always. Thank you, Amanda. Stay safe, everybody. Stay safe. This is Andy N. Signing up. Spot. Hi. Uh, this first one I wrote last week, and it's called uh, The Moment You Haven't Met Yet. Hey, sorry to stop you. I know we haven't met yet. I mean, you haven't met this me yet the me in this moment with the moment we haven't met and the version of you and I we've yet to meet. Let me slow down a second. Should I greet you with a hug? I don't want to make this awkward. In truth, we've met before, but not like this. Last time, you were pissed. Missed the significance of the occasion of each other. We could already have been lovers. The universe is always at our fingertips, but then you kissed that person you were dancing with and I realized you were kind of busy and probably weren't in the right place to be interested. It's okay if you don't remember it. We've all done shit like that before, hoping there was more to life, but passing all the stuff we think we aren't good enough for. Settling for second best, like that night's love bites on your neck. I hope this doesn't come across too forward, but it could have been me caressing your skin instead. And I know just how you'd like it. Head resting on the pillow next to mine. One hand each entwined with the others, sharing a pizza. Thin crust, extra mushrooms and garlic butter. Hot water bottle under the covers. If you'd only seen me back then, but your glazed eyes stared right through my body, I guess it's not easy to believe sometimes that I exist as an entity somewhere. But I do. I'm in your next breath. The place you go in from the one you just left. I'm in the words and the text you're about to send. I'm the one that cleans up your mess. I just wanted to try and introduce myself again, and I promise I'm not a stalker. In fact, it's you that follows me until the end, and I'm not being shallow. It's gonna happen. And I know we both like a challenge, but spending that long so close together, I thought it might be better to be friends. I feel like a lot could depend on it. The world's got us down as a force to be reckoned with, like we've got the power to change things around. Because you're me, before you were you. And I'm the next you that you'll be after now. It sounds complicated when I say it like that, put simply, I'm here as the next step on your path and I'm on your side. So those thoughts you have, you know the ones, they're lies. Where your mind tries to convince you of your lack of value, like you don't deserve the space the universe creates for you to thrive. When you wonder about the purpose of being alive, try thinking of me next time. Because this moment of your life is perfect, and how you are is perfectly fine. If you're waiting for a sign, then let me be it. There's nowhere else you need to be, because look, I'm here in the moment ahead of you, and I'm telling you, it works out eventually. I'll make sure of it. Trust me. We've got this, all rivers must lead back to the sea, so we're always flowing in the right direction. Every moment an opportunity to guide us closer to the source. So please don't ignore what you have in the present. We've all the time in the world for future intentions, but now you can choose to just pause. Forget all the ways you think past you fucked up, because we've got moment after moment after moment more to make it up. And when we keep moving through each moment, then all that pent up energy gets unstuck. Because with each blink we can redecorate the walls of our mind, modify our thoughts with a paintbrush and colour them kind. So our total existence is a kaleidoscope rainbow in the sky, 
living practiced in the length of each heartbeat passing by, each pulse a chance to shift the atmospheric hue to where the love for ourselves and each other, like there's nothing and every single moment to lose because someone else might just be having a tough moment too. And on that note, this is where I leave you. If only you knew what's in store, maybe this is the sneak preview you weren't even looking for. But for now, I've done my bit. I've brought you the lesson. I made sure you heard it, tried to make it a message you wouldn't forget. But now that we finally met, I need to go and prepare for our next moment's debut. I've got a feeling it's a life-changing one to come into. Thank you. Spoken, mate.